All right, so in Esther chapter number three, I told you there's a lot of symbolism in the book of Esther, and, and really this entire chapter kind of focuses around Haman. And we're going to go into the, the symbolism regarding Haman, how he's representative of, you know, in, in a general sense of like either Satan or even a little bit more specifically, I think the Antichrist in his actions and his planning we see here. And what, what's, what's interesting here, too, is with stories like this, you know, in one chapter, you may have one guy being representative of, of someone good, and then in another chapter, they might be representative of somebody evil. Um, and that's just the way these things go sometimes, because they're just imagery. It's just pictures. It's just trying to show you a greater truth. And um, King Ahasuerus here, if anything, he's, he's obviously uh, not behaving very good here. He's definitely uh, acting very wickedly and is just kind of letting Haman do whatever he wants to do. And he's just totally giving him liberty to, to do these evil, wicked things. And uh, let, let's, let's start reading here. So what, I'm going to do this a little bit different because I'm going to start off, we're going to go through the entire chapter. I'm going to preach through some of the verses here uh, where there's points I want to make sure I, I make. But then, excuse me, at the end, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tie it all in and we're going to look at some prophetic scriptures from like Daniel, especially in the book of Revelation, that, that talk about uh, the Antichrist. And we're going to see all the various connections between Haman and the Antichrist and how what he's doing here just lines up perfectly with, um, with what's going to happen in the future with the Antichrist. And we can see here Haman is a, is a type of the Antichrist. So look at verse number one. The Bible says, After these things did King Ahasuerus promote Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, and advanced him and set his seat above all the princes that were with him. So basically... Uh, Haman is promoted, right? And he, and he ends up receiving this promotion within the kingdom, underneath the king, to kind of being the top guy. He's lifted up above all of his peers and lifted up uh, above everyone else. And, and if you think about it, like, you know, this is, this is the Babylonian kingdom. This is, um, or the Medo-Persian kingdom, right? It's this one world government. And, and you know, they're, they're controlling the entire, essentially the entire known world at the time. And um, when, when these empires are ruling and reigning, oftentimes they're going to keep other kings and other rulers in place of other places just because it makes sense. But they're still under the authority of, you know, the main person, the main king. You know, with Egypt, it was a pharaoh. Or with Babylon, it's a king here. You know, Ahasuerus is, is that acting king kind of over everybody. So um, Haman is someone who's advanced above all of the other, you know, sub-rulers within the realm or whatever. And Haman is someone who becomes Ahasuerus kind of right-hand man and someone who's exalted. And Haman being a picture of Satan or the Antichrist, you know, Haman is someone, or excuse me, Satan is someone who is also exalted. And he was exalted before God. God made him, the Bible says he was the anointed cherub. Right? And back in the day when he was created, he was created, he was a very beautiful and angel of light. So his name Lucifer, that, that word Lucifer comes from the word Luz, which means light, you know, it's a light source. So he's a shining, you know, angel, had a lot of glory. He was very beautiful. The Bible talks about him being ornated with, with all these, uh, you know, beautiful gemstones and his tabrets, his pipes were made in him uh, very beautifully as well. So, so he sounds beautiful. He looks beautiful. He's got this, all this light and stuff. And so he was exalted. He was lifted up. And that caused him to become very proud and into sin and become very wicked, right? So the, when, when the, that's, that's who Satan is. And this is also, we're going to see a lot of similarities between Satan and Haman. That's why I say Haman is a type or type, typology of, of Satan. So keep that in mind as we, as we keep reading through this passage because you see a lot of other characteristics that are going to go along with Haman just being very satanic. Verse number two, the Bible reads, And all the king's servants that were in the king's gate bowed and reverenced Haman, for the king had so commanded concerning him. But Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence. 
Then the king's servants, which were in the king's gate, said unto Mordecai, Why transgressest thou the king's commandment? Now it came to pass, when they spake daily unto him, and he hearkened not unto them, that they told Haman to see whether Mordecai's matters would stand, for he had told them that he was a Jew. So what we see here is that the king basically had made a commandment that people would, would reverence and bow down to Haman. So we're in Haman's presence. They need to bow down unto Haman. I mean, talk about getting your head lifted up and full of pride is to have people bowing down unto you and basically, because that's what worshiping is. Worshiping is bowing down and falling on your face before somebody or something. And that's what people are doing. They're worshiping a man. They're worshiping Haman. And we see here the connection between the king and Haman, right? When, when the Antichrist comes, he's going to be pointing people to the beast, right? You got the, 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 the beast, the false prophet, and the Antichrist. And um, the 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 Antichrist gets his power from the beast. So here it's like Haman's getting his power from Satan. That's why I think he's a better example or a better type of the Antichrist than Satan. Uh, but, but obviously they all are going to have the same pride and, and, and the same spirit of Antichrist within them. Um, and here we see the king also falling um, in, in that same type here. And then, so what happens is, you know, Mordecai refuses to bow down to this man. And he's not going to reverence him either. You know, the Bible says that the, the, the name of the Lord is reverend, right? That, that, that we should reverence God's name and that his name is reverend. That's why we don't call people here reverend. That's why, you know, like there's other religions, other Christian religions where you call the, the pastor a reverend. We don't do that because the Bible says that the Lord's name is reverend. That, that, that's, you know, there's certain words that we should just kind of leave for God and, and leave for him, right? That's why the Bible says also not to be called master, not to be called father, you know, all these different terms for spiritual leaders. You know, let, let one be your master, right? Let Jesus be your master. Let him be your rabbi. Let him be your father, but not, you know, not some other man. We're not going to use those titles for man. And the same thing with reverence or, you know, being called reverend, it's the same, uh, the same thing. We're not going to do that. And Haman's a wicked man. So nowhere are you obligated to reverence some child of the devil, some wicked person, let alone bowing down unto that man. So of course, Mordecai doesn't do this. And then these other, you know, the, these other guys that were there, the king's servants are saying, oh, you know, how come you're not bowing down, Mordecai? Huh? What's wrong with you? And they're going to say, and they say, well, we're going to go tell on you and then we'll see if you're going to, you know, what you're going to do then, huh? Then, you, then you'll bow down. We're going to go tell on you. Right? So it says, um, when they speak daily, so like every day, they're just pressuring him, going like, how come you're not bowing down? And he hearkened out unto them. Then they told Haman. So they're like, okay, we're going to tell Haman on you then. So they tell Haman that, uh, that he's not going to bow down. And then it was, you know, but the reason why he's not bound down is very clear. He says, for he told them that he was a Jew. Now, when it says here that he was a Jew, you got to remember, the reason why he's calling himself a Jew is not just because he's ethnically a Jew. That's not why he's not bowing down to him because he's just ethnically a Jew. It's because of his belief system, because he's believing in the Lord, because he's believing in the Ten Commandments. He's believing that he's not supposed to be bowing down to any man. He's not supposed to be reverencing some wicked person. That's why he's not bowing down. You know, pre-Christianity as we know it under the name of Jesus Christ, you know, the true religion still existed prior to Jesus Christ in what was then known as Judaism, that it was not the same Judaism as of, of today because Judaism of today rejects the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. But the, the Jews who lived, that were saved, that believed the Lord and trusted in the Lord with all their heart prior to Jesus Christ coming, they believed Moses. They believed the prophets. They believed, you know, the God of the Bible. And that's what he's referencing here when he's calling himself a Jew. Just like when... Um, um, Ruth, the Moabitess, came in and made herself of 
the Jews, right? She, she, she joined herself unto that nation and made the God of the Jews her God. It was a religion. It was something that she believed. It was something that she was joining herself unto. And, uh, and she forsook the gods of her land, of her parents, of, you know, um, of um, the Moabites, right? She had nothing to do with that. She decided to become a, a Jew herself. It wasn't an ethnic thing. And he's telling them that's basically that that's the reason why. It would be like you today saying, I'm not bowing down to that statue. I'm a Christian. I'm not bowing down to Buddha. I'm not bowing down. I'm not bowing down to some wicked man. I'm a Christian. This is exactly the, the, the attitude that Mordecai is staying here. Verse number five. And when Haman saw that Mordecai bowed now, not, excuse me, nor did him reverence, then was Haman full of wrath. And again, th this concept of Haman just wanting people to worship him, that's exactly what the devil does. That, wh what was the devil trying to do with Jesus Christ out in the desert? Hey, if you just bow down and worship me, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the earth, right? He's, he's trying to tempt him and entice him with just being ruler of all this stuff. All you have to do is just worship me. And we know that the Antichrist, and we're going to go into a lot of these verses later, that he wants to be like the Most High. Right? That's what he wants. Satan wants to be just like the Lord. He wants to have the attention. He wants to have the power. He wants to be that person. And Haman exhibits all of these attributes of just wanting people to worship him. Because what, what does it hurt Haman going about his daily life if someone's not bowing down unto him and worshiping him? Right? I mean, like, like really. What, what, and it's one person. And he's going, well, why does that matter? And he didn't even know about it until these other people brought it up and said, did you know that Mordecai's not bowing down to you? He's not reverent. You know, it's like, he didn't even know about it and it drives him mad. And we'll go into that, uh, I think it's the next chapter, how it just makes it, he just gets consumed with this anger towards Mordecai over something so stupid as him not bowing down unto him. I mean, how, how full of yourself do you have to be to get so upset because someone's not worshiping you? Verse number six, and he thought scorn to lay hands on Mordecai alone. He's so mad. And, and this also goes with verse number four where, where he's saying that he's a Jew, right? That that's why he's not bowing down unto him because he's not just mad at Mordecai when he finds out all of this and he finds out why he's not bowing down. It says, and he thought scorn to lay hands on Mordecai alone for they had showed him the people of Mordecai. So they, they had made it, when it says they showed him, they made it known unto him, right? Because he, he told them, well, no, I'm not going to do this because I'm a Jew. So now they let Mordecai know, well, why is it that he's not bowing? It's not because he just has some personal vendetta against Haman. It's because he has a belief system, because he's a child of God. That's why he's not going to bow down to you, Haman. Wherefore, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews, that were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus, even the people of Mordecai. So he's so mad by this. He says, I can't believe there's a people that won't bow down unto me. They all need to die. And again, we'll see the verses supporting. That's exactly what the Antichrist is planning on doing with the people of God is exterminating all of them. They all need to be killed. They all need to go. Verse number seven, in the first month, that is the month Nisan, in the 12th year of King Ahasuerus, they cast Pur, that is the lot before Haman, from day to day and from month to month to the twelfth month, that is the month Adar. So what's this talking about? It says they cast Pur or the lot. When, when you're casting lots, essentially, you know, the context of, of casting lots in the Bible differs slightly depending on where you're reading about it. But very frequently, basically, in a real simple sense, the casting of lots is just a way of choosing something. Okay? Like, we would, we, you, could, you could say an election is casting lots. You could, you know, when you read about the disciples choosing Matthias to replace Judas, they cast lots of who it should be, right? So it's a way of choosing. But when you read about wicked people and people who are involved in witchcraft and stuff like that, it also talks about them casting lots, but the way that they do it 
is has more maybe chance to it because they're they're superstitious and they think that there's something to you know rolling the dice or rolling their their magic sticks or whatever they're doing right that that oftentimes that's how they do it and this is more along the way of them casting lots this way because what they're doing is they're choosing when they're going to decide to annihilate the children of God when are they going to annihilate the Jews? That's why they say basically they're casting these lots over and over again. They're trying to use their witchcraft to determine, you know, okay, what day. That's why, it's, that's why it says, excuse me, it says from day to day and from month to month. So for each month, they're going, okay, what month are we going to do this in? Okay, the lot fell on the 12th month. Okay, what day are we going to do this on? And, and this is how they decide to do this process, right? Um, and again, just, just this, even this reference to the witchcraft, we're going to see in Daniel that the, that the Bible talks about the Antichrist, that his craft prospers, that he's, he is into witchcraft, that he, he worships the God of forces and all this other stuff. We'll, we'll see that um, referenced later on. Verse number 8 says, And Haman said unto king Ahasuerus, There is a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of thy kingdom. And their laws are diverse from all people. Neither keep they the king's laws. Therefore, it is not for the king's prophet to suffer them. Now, this is so typical of a, of a child of the devil, of some satanic person, some wicked person out there that hates God and that hates God's people, that they're just going to lie about them. Right? Because he's lying about them. Is it just that their laws are just so different from everybody else's? Right? And that they don't keep the king's laws. No, they don't worship you, Haman. It's not that they don't keep the king's laws. Right? Like they're just totally lawless and they just have all their own laws and all their own rules. And they're just, you can't rule over these people at all. No, they just don't want to serve Satan. That's right. They have moral laws. They're not going to kill, steal, commit adultery. You know, look at the commandments of the Lord. They're righteous laws. And you know what? I don't know all the laws that a king of Hezuera had in his kingdom, but I bet you a lot of them lined up with the laws of the Bible. They probably had a law against stealing. They probably had a law against killing. They probably, you know, so and when you look at the big picture, you know, he wants to paint them as, oh man, they just have laws like no one else and everything. That's what they try to do even with Christians today. They want to focus in on the ones that they hate, the laws that they just can't stand, and just be like, oh man, they just have these crazy laws. Could you believe that they'd want to put, you know, a sodomite to death if they had their way? It's like, look, even the land that we live in has so many laws that, yeah, maybe the penalty isn't the same, but the laws are still there. The laws would still be governing, in general, very close or, you know, to a certain percentage to not say that it's just so drastically different, right? That they just, they're just diverse from all people. And neither keep they the king's laws. As if they're just total rebels to the king. And, and do we see any evidence of that other than Mordecai not bowing down to Haman? No, he's a liar. Just like Satan is a, is a liar and a father of it. And when he speaketh, he speaketh a lie. Because there is no truth in him. And this is exactly how Haman is acting. You know what? This is how the children of the devil all act. They're going to try to slander and, and speak in guile and speak deceitfully and say whatever they can to, uh, to, to get God's people in trouble and persecute and, and, and hurt them and injure them. I'm going to read for you from John chapter 19. You can turn there if you'd like. But um, this, this concept of him also saying, neither keep they the king's law. So he's bringing it up a little bit more personal to the king, saying, you know, they don't even keep your laws. Therefore, it is not for the king's prophet to suffer them. So it's, it's, it's not advantageous for you to suffer them because they're going against you, king. And this is actually the same thing that they did and the same railing that they did against Jesus Christ himself. Right? When Pilate was ready to let him go. Pilate's like, I don't see any cause of death in Jesus. Like, you guys want to kill him, but he hasn't done anything wrong. He hasn't done anything worthy of death, and he's ready to let him go. 
John 19, verse number 12 says, And from thenceforth Pilate sought to release him. He wanted to let him go. But the Jews cried out, saying, If thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. Now they put it to him like that. And this is actually what, what turns him from wanting to release him to now he's kind of politically now he's stuck, right? Because he doesn't care about what's right. He's a stinking politician. And when they say that to him, it says, When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus forth and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha, and it was a preparation of the Passover about the sixth hour. And he said unto the Jews, Behold your king. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto him, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. The children of the devil like to make government their God. They like to make man their God. They like to make the state their God. And they're go they, they want to get all that, that control and that power. They love that control and that power from the government and not from the God. And, and, and this is how, this is how uh, you know, most satanic people act. They want to report you to the government. And, they want, and it, it, it's so, there's so much irony. What we're hated for is wanting to have a righteous government that punishes evildoers, right? And this is what, what the First Works Baptist Church is being, is being persecuted for because they stand on God's law that homosexuals are predators and ought to be put to death according to God's word. That that's what the government should do, that the government should have a law that would uh, make it a crime to be a sodomite, and if you're found guilty of that crime, you would be put to death. That's what they believe. That's what the Bible teaches. Very clear from Scripture. We're not going to prove all that tonight. But what does the, the child of the devil want to do? They want to say, oh, you're not, you know, you have, they have their own laws and they speak against Caesar, right? They have their own laws and they don't, they're not going to follow the king's laws. So we need to put them to death. So they want to use the government to put Christians to death because we want the government to put sodomites to death. But they don't see the, the, the hypocrisy in that at all. It's kind of funny. But it's, a, it's, it's that same mentality, though, of, of just running to the government. Trying, you know, and what did they do? They're trying to get El Monte to, 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 to kick him out and cast him out. Because, oh, because they're full of hate. Yeah, they're so full of hate, they go around bombing people, right? Oh, wait, no, that's them. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Back in Esther chapter 3, verse number 9, the Bible reads, If it please the king, let it be written that they may be destroyed. See, Haman is just, is just bent on making sure that the Jews, that God's people, are destroyed. And he wants to settle for nothing less. He wants them eradicated. He wants them gone. Because they won't bow down and worship him. And again, we're, as we get into the, the verses about the Antichrist, you're going to see the Antichrist wants the same exact thing. That in the last days, when the Antichrist comes into power, you know, there's going to be a one world religion and a one world government and a one world currency. And that anyone who doesn't take the mark of the beast, and the way that you get the mark of the beast is you have to worship him, right? And if you don't take the mark of the beast, you're going to be marked for death. Because he's going to make war against the saints, and he's going to come around and try to kill everyone that believes on the Lord Jesus Christ, that won't take his mark, that won't bow down and worship him, and they're all going to be exterminated to the point where the Bible says that, yea, except those days should be shortened, there should, you know, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. So that... We won't all die, whoever is around, when Jesus Christ comes back, when, when the Antichrist is waging war against the saints and just wiping them out. But if he had enough time, everybody would be destroyed because that's what he's trying to do. That's his goal. Just like the goal of Haman is to destroy all of God's people here in this chapter. But just like Haman is not going to be successful in his task, Satan won't be, or the Antichrist won't be successful in his either. In either. <coughs> 
excuse me. So it says, if it please the king, let it be written that they may be destroyed, and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver to the hands of those that have the charge of the business to bring it into the king's treasury. So he's, he's even saying, he's even offering just to pay for this happening. He's like, I'll, I'm willing to spend 10,000 silver, just let me do this, king. I want these people destroyed. Verse 10 says, And the king took his ring from his hand and gave it unto Haman, the son of Hamaditha, the Agagite, the Jew's enemy. So here he is giving his power unto the Antichrist to let him do as he will against God's people. And the king said unto Haman, The silver is given to thee, the people also to do with them as it seemeth good to thee. So he's saying, he's even saying here, don't worry about the money, I'll pay for it. I'll hire the people to go out there. You know, I'm, I'm not worried about the money. Go ahead and do it as it seems good to you. And uh, verse number 12 says, Then were the king's scribes called on the 13th day of the first month, and there was written according to all that Haman had commanded unto the king's lieutenants and to the governors that were over every province and to the rulers of every people of every province according to the writing thereof and to every people after their language. And the name of King Ahasuerus was written and sealed with the king's ring, and the letters were sent by posts into all the king's provinces to destroy, to kill, and to cause to perish all Jews, both young and old, little children and women in one day, even upon the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month Adar, and to take the spoil of them for a prey. So he, I mean, they, he literally just makes it a law to wipe out and annihilate all the Jews. Young, old, women, children, kill them all, and then just to spoil them, which is just, just loot all their good, right? Just take all their money and loot them and spoil them for a prey. And they send out these letters into, into all the king's provinces. Like everywhere where the king has authority, they're sending out these letters that's going to happen on this day, on the 13th day of the 12th month. And what's interesting about this too, and I might cover this later, but in case I forget, you know, they were casting these lots for these particular days. Like, okay, this is the day that's going to work for us. This is going to be a day that's going to be in our favor. And actually, all of the events that happen that just completely confound their plan to bring the victory unto God's people and the defeat unto the people who hate God's people. Because there is a war at the end of the chapter and God's people end up winning. And, and it's interesting how it, at this point, he thinks, man, everything's going his way. He's got this plan. He's going to get him. He's going to kill him. And at this point, too, then a lot of God's people are getting worried and in distress because of uh, this impending doom, right? But God does save them in the end. Look at verse number 14. The Bible says, a copy of the writing for a commandment to be given in every province was published unto all people that they should be ready against that day. The posts went out being hastened by the king's commandment and the decree was given in Shushan the palace and the king and Haman sat down to drink. So there they go. Go drink it up, guys. Go party. But the city Shushan was perplexed. So the people in the city are just like, what is going on? Like, why, why is this commandment going out to kill these people? Like, no one gets it. They don't understand just the wickedness of Haman and why would anyone even want to do this to these people? They don't get it, but you know what? That, that law has been set, the commandment's given out, and there's a lot of wicked people out there who are willing to participate in that and just kill a group of people. There's other children of the devil out there who hate them as well that want to just uh, el eliminate them. So let's look at some of the references here now because that's the chapter. Look at, go to Daniel chapter 11. Keeping these verses in mind and, and these different attributes, I kind of pause on, on many of them. We're going to see how closely this fits with the Antichrist that's, that's prophesied to come. Go, back to, go, go forward to Daniel chapter 11. Daniel 11, we're going to start reading verse number 21. Daniel 11, verse number 21, the Bible reads, And in his estate shall stand up a vile person, to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom 
by flatteries. Now, obviously not every single aspect we could necessarily match up with this story because it's a story, it's a type, right? Now, maybe Haman obtained his position by flatteries. Who knows? It wouldn't surprise me at all because he's so lifted up with pride and so wicked anyways that he probably was using flattery to get the, um, the, the you know, persuade the king to, to put him in that position. It would only make sense because that's how wicked people act anyways is they use flattery to, to lay traps for people. Verse number 22 says, And with the arms of a flood shall they be overflown from before him and shall be broken, yea, also the prince of the covenant. And after the league made with him, he shall work deceitfully, for he shall come up and shall become strong with a small people. He shall enter peaceably even upon the fattest places of the province, and he shall do that which his fathers have not done, nor his father's fathers. He shall scatter among them the prey and spoil and riches, Yea, and he shall forecast his devices against the strongholds even for a time. And he shall stir up his power and his courage against the king of the south with a great army. And the king of the south shall be stirred up to battle with a very great and mighty army, but he shall not stand, for they shall forecast devices against him. Yea, they that feed of the portion of his meat shall destroy him, and his army shall overflow, and many shall fall down slain. And both these kings' hearts shall be to do mischief, and they shall speak lies at one table, but it shall not prosper, for yet the end shall be at the time appointed. Now, uh, most of this has nothing to do with the, with the story in Esther chapter 3, but I wanted to start there in verse number 21 because it says that it's, you know, he's a vile person that's standing up. This is the Antichrist is being referred to um, as someone who's vile, someone who's reprobate, that's, that's taking power. And he has these wars and everything else. But then he comes back into the land, and this is where he's going to set his, his attack against God's people. Look at verse number uh, 28. The Bible says, Then shall he return into his land with great riches, and his heart shall be against the holy covenant. And he shall do exploits and return to his own land. At the time appointed, he shall return and come toward the south, but it shall not be as the former or as the latter. For the ships of Shittim shall come against him. Therefore, he shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the holy covenant. So shall he do. He shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the holy covenant. So he keeps on bringing up, you know, the passage keeps on bringing up the holy covenant, the holy covenant, the holy covenant. It's talking about people who are saved. It's talking about, you know, the people of the Holy Covenant and that he's taking up intelligence with those that are forsaking that Holy Covenant, with people who are these other reprobates who have rejected the Holy Covenant and have nothing to do with it. They've forsaken it because they're, you know, these other children of the devil. It says, And arms shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate, and such as do wickedly against the covenant, shall he corrupt by flatteries. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploit. So when, when the Antichrist comes in, he wants to take away the good thing. He wants to set himself up and set up the abomination of desolation to be worshipped instead of God. That's what's being taught here in Daniel chapter 11. Flip back to Daniel chapter 7. Just a few pages back to Daniel chapter 7. The Bible reads in verse number 19, Then I would know the truth of the fourth beast, which was diverse from all the others, exceeding dreadful, whose teeth were of iron and his nails of brass, which devoured, break in pieces, and stamped the residue with his feet, and of the ten horns that were in his head, and of the other which came up, and before whom three fell, even of that horn that had eyes and a mouth that spake very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows. I beheld in the same horn made war with the saints. And again, this, and I'm not going to spend tons of time on this, but this, you know, these different horns are these different rulers. And this one horn came up before these other three fell. And he kind of takes the place of the three. And this horn, it says, um, spake very great things. And it says that that horn or that leader made war with the saints and prevailed against them until the ancient of days came and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High. And the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. So he's basically saying that when this horn comes into power, he makes war against the saints. He's starting, he's going to win. He's going to be defeating them, which is exactly what Revelation, when we turn there, is going to show us as well 
that the Antichrist is going to be persecuting, killing, going after the saints, and winning in the sense of winning that battle because he's killing off these saints, because saints are being martyred for the cause of Christ, and that this is what's going to happen. And he says, until the Ancient of Days, until Jesus Christ comes back, he's going to be able to keep doing this. And it says that judgment was, and judgment's given, right? So the judgment that's going to be given is that Satan's going to be stopped and then God's wrath is going to be poured out. That's going to be the judgment that's given. That's the justice that's going to come against uh, Satan and the Antichrist and all the children of the devil that are on the earth at that time. Flip over to chapter 8, uh, verse number 23. Daniel 8, 23, the Bible says, And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance, and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. And, you know, the Antichrist is a reprobate. He's a child of the devil. And you could also just match up the attributes that we see here with the attributes laid out in Romans chapter 1. Or 1 Timothy chapter uh, 3, or excuse me, 2 sec um, Timothy, right? Where we looked at that on Sunday. And, um, you know, how it says that they're um, haters of God. It says that they're fierce that they don't have mercy, that they're, they're um, you know, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, right? They're full of pride. All of these attributes are, in, are, are also attributes of Haman. They're attributes of the Antichrist. They're attributes of Satan, right? And these are attributes to just look out for. Now, obviously, any person in general, even every, any saved person, can have you know, maybe one of those attributes or a couple of those attributes or something. But these reprobates have all of those attributes. They're full of all wickedness, of all unrighteousness. And this is how you can really spot these guys. And, and you know, they, they, they dress up like sheep, but inwardly they possess all of these things. They want to have this form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. So he has a fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up, verse 24, and his power shall be mighty, but look at this, but not by his own power. Just like Haman had mighty power, but it really wasn't his own power. He had to get that power from the king of Ahasuerus. He didn't have the authority to go and do what he wanted to do without getting that from the king. Right? He had to get that, that, the seal, the ring from the king in order to make, those, um, to make those decrees actually stand and have power. And his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. And he shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper and practice and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. And through his policy also, he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand. And I believe that's, called, that's talking about witchcraft there, that craft. Uh, and he shall magnify himself in his heart and by peace shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand. Uh, that, you know, that phrase there, by peace shall destroy many. It's so paradoxical, right? But this is how children of the devil think. They're illogical completely, and they think that, and what they're going to think, that when they kill the people of God, when they kill the saints, they're actually going to think they're doing God's service. The Bible teaches that as well. So as we get closer and closer to the end days, just realize that these people are going to be so brainwashed into their way of thinking and so much darkness is going to be in their heart and in their minds, they're going to really honestly be thinking that we're the enemy to the point of we need to exterminate these people and this Antichrist has performed these miracles is God and he's saying these people need to go because they're like a cancer. We need to wipe them out and the people who are going to come after us are going to be ones thinking they're doing God's service. That they're actually doing a good thing. Be aware of that. This is, this is the mindset that people are going to have. Now, we need to be that light. We need to be able to try to shine through. We need to use the word of God that's quick and sharp and, and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword that pierces even in dividing asunder of soul and spirit. Um, and stand on that. I mean, that's our only defense anyways. You're fighting against the people that are, that are so dark and wicked. You know, we don't have any other tool but the Word of God that we're going to be able to use to survive anyways. And you know, in those days, most people probably won't survive. But you know what? Some will. And we're, we're gonna, that's why we're going to watch. Right? We're not going to be 
drunken as those that are drunken in the night, and, and we're not going to be sleeping like those that sleep in the night. We're going to be watching and waiting so that we can make it unto the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because I do truly and honestly believe that that the people who love God and are watching and are, and, are, and are ready and are established and grounded in the faith, that God will bless many of those people with the ability to still be alive and remain at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. I think it's going to be a lot of the Christians or believers who are asleep right now, who aren't doing any works for God, who aren't really doing anything, that will be martyred, you know, quickly. That they'll be taken and, and executed way quicker than those who are already grounded and ready and firm in their faith. And I think, I don't think it's because we're going to be able to run and find hiding places. I think it's because God's just going to protect those people until the end. Because the people who are going to be preaching the word of God and just standing firm, yes, he's going to allow some, some, you know, some of those people to be martyred, I'm sure. Right? right? I, I, I'm, I don't doubt that at all. But I do think also out of that group, you're going to have probably way more of those people making it unto the end, unto the glorious appearing of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So by peace shall destroy many. So he's going to say, oh, this is, for, this is how we're going to have peace. Yeah, you're going to have peace by wiping out all of your opposition. Right? That's, that's the Antichrist method of getting peace. We'll just kill everyone who's against us. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hands. He's going to try to fight against Jesus Christ. Not going to work. Flip back to, or flip, flip all the way to Revelation. Revelation chapter 13. It's the last place we'll look tonight. Revelation chapter 13. Just a short study focusing on some of the scriptures on the Antichrist. Not all of them. I just want to want to try to find some of these ones that I think tie in really closely with Esther chapter three and this imagery and this foreshadowing that Esther three is is showing about the Antichrist. Just giving a little bit of a deeper look into that and all the 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 satanic uh, symbolism with Haman and how wicked Haman is. Revelation thirteen verse number one. The Bible reads, "And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast." Rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon, excuse me, gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And again, just like we saw in Daniel, we see the power is coming from someone else. So like here it's the dragon. The dragon is representative of Satan. And the beast is representative of the Antichrist. And the Satan is giving the Antichrist his power to uh, have his seat and great authority. Haman was receiving this great authority from King Ahasuerus, who would be rep more representative of Satan and, and giving uh, Haman as his uh, Antichrist to be in that position of power and great authority. Verse number three, And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And this is what Haman wanted. Now, it's not what he gets, right? So in the story, he doesn't play out everything that's going to happen in the future. But, but he has that same exact mindset and the same exact mentality. He wants people to worship him. Verse 5, And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him, look at this, to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And the power was, and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. Remember in Esther chapter 3, he sent out the posts into all kingdoms, all the lands, and it was in every language that they're, they're making the proclamation of war against the saints, war against the Jews, war against God's people, that they need to be ready to, to, for that day to come so that they could wipe out man, woman, boy, girl, and just ex completely exterminate them in every land in the, in, on the wor in the world. Right? This is exactly what the Antichrist is going to do. 
He's going to make war with the saints, and, and he has that power over all kindreds and tongues and nations. Verse 8 says, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. We already saw Haman was in that position. Satan, or Ahasuerus, already made that law. Hey, you're going to worship him. You're going to bow down to Haman when he walks by. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life, in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Yeah, all the unbelievers, all the, all the children of the devil, they're going to go and worship the Antichrist. But you know what? Mordecai didn't. Mordecai's not bowing down because his name is written in the book of life. And, you know, Mordecai is that great example of the end times Christian who's not going to buckle under the pressure, who's not worried about you know, what the, what the people are going to do or say, and they keep saying, oh, you're not going to bow down. You know, and as things get closer, I don't know exactly when the Mark of the Beast is going to be um, implemented, right, with the Antichrist and everything else, but may, I assume there's going to be some time where the Mark of the Beast exists before the war is waged against the saints, right? There's probably going to be a short period of time. The Antichrist comes into power, and then he's going to say, okay, you know, in order to buy and sell and do whatever, you need to get this mark. And the reason why I know, I mean, the Antichrist is going to have to be in power for that to be implemented because to get it, you have to worship the beast, right? So, but he, I, I doubt he's going to have the war exactly started until after that's already been implemented for a short time. And what we're probably going to see is people going, oh, you're not taking the mark? What do you mean? You're not taking the mark? You're not going to take the mark? You're not going to worship the beast? You're not going to take the mark? Why not? And then they're going to be going and telling, oh, these people aren't taking the mark. These Christians that are meeting in this church over here, they're not taking the mark. And they're going to go tell and tattle to Satan, to the Antichrist, and let them know, oh, these people aren't taking the mark. We, hey, we're doing what's good for everybody. You don't, you don't care about people? You see the attitude prevailing. Oh, you're, you're not? You're not doing that? You're not, you're not wearing your mask? What, do you hate people? What, do you want people to die? The self-righteousness. And look, I, I don't want to get into the whole mask thing, but it's, it's, this, it's this mentality of like, oh, you're not doing this? You're evil. You're wicked. You don't care. You're insensitive. You're, you know, you're all this stuff. And it's like, no. No. Like there's, other, there's actually other options for thinking people than that. But, but this is what's going to happen when the mark of the beast is coming around. They're going to be saying, what are you doing not taking the mark of the beast? I mean, did you see his miracles? Do you see what he can do? And they're going to think we're crazy. And they're actually going to start hating us to the point of where they're going to gladly take up arms and start killing people for not taking the mark of the beast and not worshiping the beast or the image. Not taking the mark of his name. That's what's going to happen. Esther 3, you know, shows us this foreshadowing, this picture, this imagery of, of what it's going to be like, of, who, of, of kind of how the Antichrist is going to be like and, and what attributes he's going to have. It lines up perfectly. That's why I showed you the more clear scriptures about the Antichrist showing how, how, how this really represents that. Obviously, we don't just get all of our doctrine on Antichrist from Esther chapter 3, but it does fall in line pretty well, pretty perfectly with all the rest of the scripture that, that talks about it. So uh, those, there's a lot more symbolism to go as we go through the book of Esther, but this is a great chapter to just to, to start viewing Haman as the Antichrist. Because that, that, this parallel or this, this symbolism kind of carries through all the way through the story. I may not always be referencing this so heavily as I did tonight, but just keep that in mind as we go through the future chapters and just kind of be on the lookout on your own for, for other attributes that you're going to see pop up, especially if I don't necessarily call them out during the sermon in the weeks to come. But uh, let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for um, providing us with your words. I pray that you would please illuminate our hearts, illuminate our minds, dear Lord. Help us to understand and, and have wisdom, gain wisdom and knowledge through your word. Lord, teach us and instruct us. I pray that you please help us to be ready. Um, against that day. I pray that you would please help us to be emboldened, emboldened and strengthened to do great exploits like, like the book of Daniel talks about that the people of God did great exploits um, during that time of heavy persecution. That's exciting, Lord. There's, there's um, 
you know, some people might might want to shy away from that, but I actually look forward to it. I think there's going to be, you know, we have a very short lo life to live on this earth anyways. Uh, we don't want to waste it. We, let, we want to be used of you in, in the most mighty way we can, Lord. We'll, uh, we're here. Uh, whatever it is that, that you would have us to do, Lord, help us to make your make your will known unto us and that we could um, just, just stand and having done all to stand here, Lord, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.